Good evening and welcome to Thai PBS World. I'm Tep Chai Yong. Yes, I'm Natha Gomenwatin and you can watch us live on Facebook, YouTube and on our website because we bring Thailand to the world and we bring the world to Thailand. So every Thursday evening, starting at 6 o'clock, we meet and we discuss, we talk and we analyze all the major issues of the week. And of course, the past one week has been another busy week for politicians. Yes. Many, many of them continue to hit the street to meet with constituents and mm -hmm. to recruit new members. Yeah. And uh, it, it looks like we are in the middle of a <laughs> campaign season, yes. even though officially this campaigning is not allowed, right? Yeah, <laughs> and it seems a lot more are coming and we have to keep closing, keep very closely watching all the activities yeah. coming out on the street yeah. or any panel of discussion because politicians have joined in many yeah. events nowadays. And it's very interesting that uh, more and more people are talking with more and more certainty that the 24th mm -hmm. of February next year yes. will be the date of the elections. Yeah. At least nobody has come out to dispute <laughs> this. <laughs> but it's no official announcement mm. yet. And given this, Prime Minister Prayut Chan Ocha hasn't announced any formal role that what he no. goes to, he's going to play in politics no. at all. But talking about the election date, uh, mm -hmm. we have talked to officials of the election commission. Ask them, I mean, point blank, whether 24th of February will be the election day or not. They mm -hmm. said, well, that the day, starting from that day on, yes. the election commission will be ready to hold elections. Uh -huh. So the meaning is that the election commission will be ready to organize elections starting on the 24th of February. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that it will be held that day. Yes, <laughs> because in fact, time span yeah. can be extended until 9th of May next year yeah. of in course, terms of yeah. election yeah. span. But of course, the Election Commission, even though they will be directly responsible for organizing the election, they need to listen to signals from the real powers that be. That is the uh, yeah. NCPO, the mm -hmm. National Council of Peace and Order, yes. which will have the ultimate say when the uh -huh. election will, will, will take place. Yeah. Yes, but let's take a look at the main activities happening this week, especially the formal launch of a new party, Thai Raksa Chat Party, which is quite exciting. Let's take a look at what happened on the official announcement of the leader of Thai Raksa Chat Party, Khun Pri Chaphon Pong Phanit. All of a sudden, this the newly formed party managed to steal headlines from the media. Yes. And it's, it's quite interesting that because the, many of the party members and most of the members of the executive committee of the party are closely linked to people in the Pur Thai Party. Yes. The Pur Thai Party, which is the former ruling party. And of course, everybody knows that it's quite asso closely associated with Kun Taksin Chinawat. And if you notice, people who come on the stage on the formal launch of Thai Raksa Chat Party tend to be younger generation. But if we look closer, they are heir or heiress close to Shinawat family. And, and, some, the, and some other heavyweight uh, politicians yes. in, the, uh, in the Pur Thai Party. Yeah. You look at their family names, their, their, mm -hmm. their, their, their surnames, they are very really familiar. Yes, the leader is Prishaphon Pong Panit, the 37 years old, son of former Deputy Education Minister, Seum Sak Pong Panit, and the three other deputy leaders of the party are like Pong Sak, Pu Sit Sakun, and along with former Pur Chai MP Suni Leung Vichit and Priti Chai Viri Yarod. No, the young leader of this new party, Kun Pi Chapon, insisted yesterday that his party has nothing to do with Pur Thai party. Yes. But of course, we have to take this with a grain, <laughs> a grain of salt, right? Yeah. <laughs> because I think it's no secret that uh, mm -hmm. as far as the personalities are concerned, they yes. are so closely related to those in Pur Thai party. Mm -hmm. So the big question is why uh, this new party has to be formed? Mm -hmm. Why don't these people I mean, continue to work with Pur Thai Party so that the uh, Pur Thai Party would become a powerful party and play a key role in the, next the coming election? Mm -hmm. 
this is analyzed as dual dual strategy yeah. party and Thai Raksa Chat is being analyzed as the so-called sister party uh, of Pure yeah. Thai party mm -hmm. and in previous week we also analyzed that they have also set up Pure Tham and Pure Chat parties okay. as well Kun Jatulon Chai Seng a core member of Pure Thai party has an explanation I mean that should give us uh, a good graphs as to why uh, the Thai Raksa Chat party had to be formed and, and what kind of relations uh, mm -hmm. there will be between these parties. Kun Chaturon, of course, a very uh, senior member of uh, Pure Thai Party. He was speaking to reporters two days ago, and he was asked why the, a number of mm -hmm. uh, Pure Thai Party members, uh, in, including many former MPs, have turned their back on the party to join new parties or to try to uh, join some of the existing ones. So mm -hmm. Kun Chaturon has two major reasons to explain why this happened. Yes, is it something to do with the threat of dissolution of Pure Thai Party? Must be one of the main reasons that we are seeing splitting of major party from Pure Thai. Yeah, Kun Chaturon made it quite clear that uh, Pure Thai Party still faces the prospect of being dissolved because uh, there have been charges that the party has been under the influence of former Prime Minister Kun Thaksin Chinawat. Of course, we remember uh, footage of Kun Thaksin uh, sending messages from abroad mm. to members of the Pure Thai Party. And then we have seen uh, a number of uh, senior Pure Thai Party members flocking to Hong Kong yes. and to meet him there. Yeah. And then Kun Thaksin also went to the extent of uh, sending some sort of... Uh, sending some, something that was seen as an instruction to the party as how to behave in the coming election. So all mm -hmm. these I mean, are being taken as the, as the uh, uh, so-called evidence to mm -hmm. confirm suspicions that Kun Thaksin still wields influence over this party. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that is the assumption going on that the election commission will have to investigate on this issue. That, that's why it's one of the reasons that the threat is blooming large for Pure Thai Party. So to be on the safe side, uh, mm -hmm. some of the party members decided to leave the party to join the new ones. And of course, uh, the second reason is quite, also quite obvious that uh, Kun Chaturun see the new electoral system under the constitution as something designed to weaken major political parties. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Pure Thai Party he, he claims uh, is the main target of this uh, new system. Mm. Yes. Another suspicion is people raise the argument whether Kun Sudarat and Kun Chaturon are not on the same page. Mm. That's why they will have to set up different parties in order to be sister parties of Pure Thai Party. Mm. But it's definitely this is going to be a very interesting uh, election uh, because of the new players that are on the scene right now and some other new players that will be uh, coming along, so mm -hmm. uh, these elections will be something quite unpredictable, yes. unlike previous elections, that you can sit down and reanalyze the, and foresee the results of the election. Mm -hmm. But this time around, because of the new the electoral system in which every vote counts, mm -hmm. and there is a provision that practically puts a, a ceiling on the number of uh, house seats that each of the parties will get. So, the, so uh, this new system is seen by many as an attempt to prevent an absolute majority to be won by any single party. Mm -hmm. And of course, Pure Thai Party always see itself as a victim of this system. Yeah, but surely we will see all momentum are coming on in terms of politics in Thailand. And as long as we are waiting for the formal announcement of the election date. So we will see, I think, more momentum or more activities will be coming on. But there was another interesting development uh, early this, this week. Two days ago, of course, you, you must have heard uh, Foreign Minister Kun Don Pramat Vinay when he was asked about uh, the possibility of allowing foreign observers to monitor the election. And he was quite outright about it. He said, no, no, that Thailand doesn't need uh, foreign observers because we can do the job ourselves. No, if we allow them to come in, then we are going to, it would be an admittance of, 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 of our weakness, of our inability to organize elections. 
Well, but international <laughs> community will be looking at this issue from different angles yeah. because if we would like to have free and fair election, we would need to allow international observers mm -hmm. to see what's on the ground yeah. during the election day. And dates. then just yesterday, the day after Kundon uh, said something along this line, the election commission members met with uh, subcommittees in the National uh, Legislative Assembly to discuss the coming election. And the EC, the Action Commission's members, told these people in the subcommittees that there had been a request from the European Union to send an army of observers to monitor yeah. the election. The figures of between 200 and 400 observers were mentioned, uh -huh. but this still cannot be confirmed. But, but the Action Commission, I mean, seemed to be admitting that there had been a request uh -huh. from EU, I mean, for observers to be sent here to monitor the election. Of course, this will be quite interesting as to how this will turn, this will turn out. No, but the, the people we talked to in the election commission tried to explain that I mean, having foreign observers in elections is something common among I mean, countries in the region. Yes. For example, and uh, one of the officials uh, wh whom I talked to this morning mm -hmm. cited as an example that in the Cambodian elections in July this year, they invited uh, representative of the Thai Election Commission to observe the election there. Mm -hmm. So for him, he doesn't see any harm in having foreign observers yes. in, during the next election. Yes, but that is by invitation from Cambodian government. Yeah. But mm -hmm. this is the other <laughs> way around, that EU international observer make a request oh. of having army of observers to yeah. Thailand. So we have to wait for confirmation oh. from EC whether they will give green light for those observers to come into Thailand. But Kun Chai, next year we will have a big event the whole year round yeah. for Thailand because Thailand will take chairmanship from Singapore as chairman of ASEAN yes. for the whole year of yeah. 2019. Because next week in Singapore there will be the ASEAN summit, right? Kun Pajutan Docha, the Prime Minister, will be representing Thailand in, in that summit. And during that event, Thailand will officially take over the chairmanship of ASEAN. Yes. No, but the chairmanship, I mean, doesn't actually begin before the 1st of January next year. So Thailand will become uh, formally the chairman of ASEAN uh -huh. starting on the 1st of January. Yes. That means that the next one year will be quite a busy time for Thailand as, yes. an, as the host, as the chairman of the, this biggest regional organization. Yes, the taking over will take place in Singapore on 15th of November, but formal chairmanship will start early, the first day of next year. So it would be very interesting to listen to what Singapore ambassador to Thailand have to say about the role of Singapore and what Singapore has done in this past one year in taking chairmanship of ASEAN. For joining me on Thai PBS program, the first question is what is the priorities of Singapore as an ASEAN chair this year? Well, we have two main themes for ASEAN chairmanship. Uh, the two themes being resilience and innovation. I think resilience is important because uh, ASEAN must remain strong, united, resilient, uh, so that we can deal with all the challenges that we have to face. And there are a lot of challenges. Um, innovation, the second theme, that's important because um, this is key, the key to sustainable and uh, dynamic economic growth for our region, uh, for our social development, especially in this digital age. In line with these two themes, we have, um, we have established an ASEAN Smart Cities Network, or ASCN for short. Um, the idea is to bring cities, companies and governments together. Uh, to develop, to fund, and implement commercially viable urban solutions. Um, the objective is to improve the livelihoods of the people in ASEAN. Whatever we do has always got to come back to the people. So how does Singapore, as ASEAN chair, set its position on global issues? Because nowadays there are many global issues like trade war, cyber security, and the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. This geopolitical environment certainly has become more uh, uncertain. In order to respond uh, effectively to the challenges before us, 
ASEAN needs to continue to look outward, uh, champion trade, uh, liberalisation and engage the rest of the world. That's important. ASEAN also needs to be cohesive and united and strengthen uh, substantive cooperation on all three of our pillars, economic, social, political. As ASEAN Chair, Singapore has been working closely with uh, our fellow ASEAN members um, to move in that direction. The stronger our cooperation, the more effective ASEAN will be. And uh, the more ASEAN can protect our collective interests uh, in an grow increasingly uncertain world. Talking to the Singaporean ambassador is our correspondent, our reporter, Kun Pong Sathat Sukkapong. Kun Nata, you must remember a small incident a few months back when it was clear that Thailand was going to take over the chairmanship of ASEAN. There was an article in the Jakarta, Jakarta Post yes, that's right. in Indonesia by a quite, quite a well-known columnist who didn't like the idea of uh, mm -hmm. Thailand becoming uh, chairman of ASEAN in the present context because he believes that uh, Thailand didn't deserve the chairmanship because of the uh, domestic uh, situation in, in this country, mm -hmm. uh, still under military dictatorship. No, but, but that was such a storm in the teacup, but enough yes. to make a, hit, a, a headlines for quite a few days. But the, the issue is that the ASEAN chairmanship, I mean, rotates on the alphabetical order, right? So it, doesn't, so it means that uh, it's automatic <laughs> that Thailand would be mm -hmm. the chairman uh, of, of ASEAN yes. after Singapore. Yeah, but I can't imagine the ASEAN community, especially the leader, will mm. say that they won't support Thailand, oh, yeah. especially if they stick to the principle of non-interference yeah. in this regard. Mm. But what is the evaluation of Singapore in being chairman of ASEAN this year? Let's listen to what Ajahn Prabhat Thep Chatri from Thammasat University has to say. Talking about Singapore, mm -hmm. the ASEAN chair this year, can you measure the success of Singapore as ASEAN chair amidst the many disruptions, trade war, the rise of protectionism, and the rise of China? I think uh, Singapore has always uh, done a good job you know, uh, to be a chair of ASEAN in the past. And this year, uh, Singapore also has done well, you know, overall. Uh, but, uh, and particularly concerning about initiative on uh, innovation that would be uh, correspond to uh, what I already mentioned about ASEAN 4.0. And, uh, and the Singapore initiative on smart city, you know, the, the, the idea about smart city. I think that is the, that is the uh, uh, highlights of uh, Singapore as a chairman. But I think that Singapore should have, should have done more, you know, particularly concerned about the uh, uh, BRI project, ASEAN common position on the BRI project. And, and also uh, uh, Singapore should have done more concerning about uh, putting ASEAN as a people-centered organization and also on uh, ASEAN centrality. And, um, and, also, but, and particularly also uh, concerning about the, the rise of protectionism. ASEAN so far could not come up with a common position yet on how to deal with the, the, the global protectionism. Next year, Thailand will be a, an ASEAN chair. So what should Thailand set its position as ASEAN chair on global issues? I think that um, next year Thailand will be the chair of ASEAN mm -hmm. and there are several things that Thailand should do as a chair. Number one is that uh, what I would call ASEAN 4.0 agenda. I think that Thailand and ASEAN uh, should be able to be uh, ready and well prepared for the fourth industrial revolution that would include the, uh, the new areas of cooperation among ASEAN countries on uh, innovation, on uh, science and technology, and on uh, digital economy. I think this, can, that this should be a, a new area of cooperation, and that Thailand maybe next year 
should come up uh, with new uh, new initiative on this. It is going to be number one. Number two is going to be on the ASEAN connectivity. Mm-hmm. I think Thailand always uh, put a lot of emphasis on ASEAN connectivity because Thailand uh, happens to be located at the center of ASEAN community. So we we will be um, how can I say the ASEAN uh, transportation hub. You know, if we succeed in implementing the ASEAN connectivity project, linking ASEAN countries together through roads and railway, mm-hmm. it is going to be uh, number one, number two priority for uh, for Thailand next year. Number three is going to be uh, put people at the center of ASEAN. It's going to be number three agenda. Uh, how can we implement the so the slogan that we uh, uh, talk about that for many years that we would like to make ASEAN uh, a people center organization. We should come up with concrete measures to uh, put ASEAN to make ASEAN the people center organization. And then the last one on the intra ASEAN cooperation is that uh, uh, Thailand should initiate some kind of ASEAN cooperation to deal with the the ties to stem the ties of protectionism that is uh, rising very fast, particularly in the West, you know, in the U.S. and Europe. Right now, there are a lot of sentiments concerning about protectionism. You know, one of the uh, preoccupations of ASEAN is to have meetings, and in each single year, I mean, mm-hmm. in average, they have hundreds of of close to 1,000 meetings, big and small, medium-sized meetings yes. on a wide range of topics uh-huh. every year, right? And these are the meetings that the, the, all the ASEAN leaders, officials have to attend. And of course, as the host, as the chairman of ASEAN next year, most of the, <laughs> uh, many of the meetings will be held here. And of course, it will be a big job for the Thai government and yes. especially the foreign ministry to handle. Yes, especially Ministry of Foreign Affairs will be the main major responsible organization to arrange all the meetings which will happen in Thailand, not less than 170 meetings. I talked to Kun Busadi Santipitak, Director General of Information at Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Thailand, what so far what Thailand has been prepared to host ASEAN Summit next year. Um, the preparations towards um, Thailand assuming the chairmanship of ASEAN in 2019, um, progress has been made in terms of preparation. Uh, we have a national committee that's undertaking all the tasks related to our ASEAN chairmanship next year. The Prime Minister is chairing the national committee and there are uh, four subcommittees under this national committee uh, comprising of various different uh, government agencies and all the relevant stakeholders and partners taking in this preparation process. Um, it can be divided into substantive preparations, uh, into public awareness and media communications in terms of protocol and as well as logistics um, uh, preparations to ensure that our chairmanship will be successful in all its aspects. And what is exact date that would mean official beginning of Thailand as the next chairmanship of ASEAN? Yes, officially the chairmanship for Thailand will begin on the 1st of January 2019 and it will end on the 31st of December of the same year. But um, on the 15th of November this year, on the last day of the meeting of the ASEAN summit and the related uh, summit meetings in Singapore, uh, which will take place between the 13th and 15th of November in Singapore, on the 15th itself, uh, General, uh, His Excellency General Prayutjan Ocha, the Prime Minister will be um, taking uh, over the chairmanship. Uh, there will be a handover of the chairmanship from uh, Singapore to Thailand on the 15th of November. It's the official handover ceremony on Rohingya and South China Sea. Mm-hmm. What do you think the role of Thailand should be in order to cope or to, to manage on this very two subjects. 
Uh, the two issues that you have mentioned, um, we of course attach importance to. Um, of course, in, in the past uh, uh, few uh, decades, we were closely monitoring the Korean Peninsula as well as one key issue. Uh, but of course, uh, right now, there seems to be positive developments in that area, but we still have to continue to ensure that the momentum is uh, maintained. But in terms of South China Sea, I think there has been significant developments, uh, particularly with the agreement of all the of ASEAN and China uh, to uh, discuss, negotiate, and of course, agree on the elements of the code of conduct uh, to on the on the regional code of conduct in the South China Sea. So I think this is very important. But for Thailand, because we are not a claimant state, um, so we support all processes, dialogue, all um, negotiations that would lead to peaceful settlement of uh, the disputes. Uh, it's a maritime dispute. So we hope that all the claimant states uh, will be able to find uh, acceptable solutions in terms of legal, um, but diplomatic process in terms of uh, giving support uh, to the negotiations and dialogue is very important. For Thailand, we only wish uh, that the South China Sea would be a sea of prosperity, of, um, of peace, of prosperity and sustainable development, uh, especially in marine protection, marine, marine uh, environmental protection as well, because there's so much resources there. Um, in, for the issues in the Rakhine state, um, I think it's an issue that has been in discussion amongst the ASEAN member states. Um, we have uh, the ministers, the leaders have been given briefings by uh, the Myanmar uh, representatives um, continuously. So we wish to support um, any dialogue or process within Myanmar. Um, at the same time, other elements in the regional framework, uh, the establishment uh, within Myanmar about the Commission on Inquiry, we look forward to hearing progress from them. And I think there are other uh, 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 forum taking place uh, within the UN and so on, or the bilateral arrangements and dialogue process going on between Bangladesh and Myanmar. So all of this is, I think, is very important. Uh, for Thailand, we wish to be a, a, um, a good neighbor. We wish to support the dialogue process, and we wish to offer our own experience in terms of long-term development cooperation. How do you like to encourage Thai population, Thai people, to be good hosts? for this very important event? I, I think uh, for uh, the Thai uh, community, Thai people, um, ASEAN is a cornerstone of the Thai foreign policy. And of course, it's not something new uh, for any Thais. We often talk about ASEAN. Most people, I think, uh, are becoming more aware about ASEAN. There's more mobility in terms of traveling to each other's country, learning more about each other. You see intercultural communication. You see people learning um, each other's languages more. You see um, ASEAN people working together in different surroundings. So I think for Thailand, um, each and every Thai can join us the the uh, uh, the government uh, the public sector to become uh, good hosts uh, when there is uh, because of the so many uh, meetings that will take place and all these meetings will take place all over Thailand so the different provinces will be able to join us in becoming good hosts so we hope that in in a small way in every way that the Thais will be warm uh, hospitable uh, host for all the delegates coming to Thailand. So next year, won't be surprised if you see Thai flag and ASEAN flag all around in many cities. And we all have to be good hosts mm. for all ASEAN members who will come to join many meetings in Thailand. So the ASEAN will come to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we will try to explain more how ASEAN relates to Thailand yeah. because we bring ASEAN to you as well. And next week, mm. Thai PBS will host a very important yeah. meeting yeah. as we well. We have our own important yes. conference too. <laughs> yes, it's the conference about value of public media, which will happen at the Thai PBS on 15 and 16 of November. It's the cooperation between Thai PBS, Goethe Institute, Input International Public Television, Communication Faculty from Jilalongkorn University, and communication faculty of Thammasat University and NIDA to cooperate together to help to hold a Thai PBS public media conference and mini input 2018 in Thailand. This will be the very first time ever to have this kind of international organization, international conference at the Thai PBS. And the key event is to have a speech, keynote speech, Keynote speaker is former Prime Minister Kun Anand Panyarachun. He will be talking about value of public media in 21st century. 
So it's not the only issue about Thai PBS, of course, but issue about public media in the world and the value for people, especially in this day and age that social media are blossoming and having closer yeah. approach to Thai people and people in general. And right now we have our special guest, Kun Pipop Panichapak, Deputy Managing Director of Thai PBS, and he will join one panel of discussion on this international conference. Sawadee ka, Kun Pipop ka. Thank you for joining us. Thank yes. you. You'll be Spot. one of the key speakers of a panel discussion on the value of public media. Well, yeah, and actually we all know that today everybody seems to have access to media not only as viewers or listeners, but also as producer of meanings. Yes. So actually, it can be what we call a media crisis. If, uh, people mention about the disruption in the media, mm. but yeah. for me, I think it's a great opportunity for the public media to do something to engage more people mm -hmm. into the dialogue that's it's going on in our society. So mm -hmm. there's opportunity hidden in the crisis, in the of disruption. Of course. <laughs> I, every time I go to any conference, people talk about uh, the, the dilemma mm -hmm. of where the public media is going to be. I say, well, it's going to be fine. It's going to mm -hmm. be with the people, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's going to be part of this great dialogue. Uh, one of the purpose of the public media is to guarantee participation of the public. Yeah, yeah. And I think by having this kind of devices that we all have who render great opportunity. Of course, there's a challenge yeah, because yeah. Um, society seems to be really fragmented when everybody gets a chance to do their communication. Mm -hmm. Just think about the big disaster that's mm -hmm. going on around us, like in Indonesia, uh -huh. people can get panicked with fake news, false news, both intentionally and <laughs> unintentionally. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I think more than ever, the role of public media is more um, relevant mm -hmm. to the media landscape today. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you don't see crisis for public media at the moment, even though social media perhaps is much more influential nowadays. Well, to be quite honest, I see a crisis, but within the <laughs> crisis, there's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's how we handle it. It's how the public. In, interpret the meaning of the public media. We want to be something relevant. It, uh, in the old days, maybe public media is about uh, bringing information from top to the bottom. But today, I think it's mm -hmm. all about two-way communications and how we can guarantee the more engagement and more um, participation into creating meaning. Mm -hmm. There's election coming up in Thailand <laughs> next <laughs> next uh, year, so yes. uh, public media will play a crucial role mm -hmm. in 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 carrying on this kind of uh, engaging dialogue that mm -hmm. everybody feel that there's an ownership yes. in that piece of conversation. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you must be preparing to bring what Thai PBS has been doing in order to engage like with local communities to put their content e nationwide. Exactly. Today we have the word user generated content and. Thai PBS is really invested. We um, work both on ground and we develop an application where people can participate in our program, uh, criticizing it or uh, giving inputs to what we're doing, and that's one thing. And secondly, we think that we, uh, Thai PBS should be a reference media, a media that people can referring to when they have doubts. Mm -hmm. So not only Thai PBS, but I think public media will be more like a reference source for the society when, when, when things are in doubt. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, the role of uh, public broadcasting has always been questioned I mean, by critics. Of course. Of course. I mean, because you use <laughs> taxpayers' money and your programs I mean, don't always get good rating. I mean, that, that's yeah. the perception of the people that yeah. I mean, good programs must, must get good ratings, right? right. So the, but the challenge is how to overcome this kind of uh, perception that, that even though the programs that Thai PBS and other public broadcasters produce may not I mean, have good rating, you may not be watched by millions of people, mm. but, but they have some kind of values that, exactly. that, that doesn't reflect, it's not reflected in, in, in productions or, or programs or in commercial I mean, media. Well, the thing is the economy of media has always been economy of attention. Mm. 
But I think what the public media is trying to do, not only in Thailand but the world over, is to creating meaningful dialogue. Mm. And when you do meaningful dialogue, you, 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 sometimes you don't get the best of the best of eyeballs, yeah. but you get quality um, conversations going on. Mm. So one thing which will be on one of the panels is about quality rating mm -hmm. uh, and how we can value the program uh, according to its merits that it mm. create mm -hmm. for the viewers and the society. So I think that's, that's another thing that should be interesting during the, the meeting that we will have this month. Yeah. Mm. Uh, how should we define good media? Mm -hmm. The most the people watch or, yeah. or something that when people watch, they, 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 they get something out of it yeah. and they go do something in the yeah. real world. Mm -hmm. At Thai PBS, we always said, they, uh, the viewers not necessarily have to be tuned in all the time. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. They can tune out to the on-ground activities, to the civil roles. We're mm -hmm. really interested in communicating so people become more of the citizenship, yeah. doing mm -hmm. something contributing to their own community. Yeah. So public broadcasting is more than what you see on the big screen, no. <laughs> right? It's no longer the, <laughs> the representative of public broadcasting. Not it's anymore. about your activities and how you reach people I mean, through other platforms. And it, it reflects clearly on, if you look at our program uh, uh, that we have, mm -hmm. it's not staying tuned from morning until midnight that we're looking for. We want something that, say, parents watch it and they mm -hmm. go out with their children and do something in the park. Okay. <laughs> they mm -hmm. go watch us and they think about something in their society, the community. So it's kind of like, I want to call it action TV mm -hmm. or action media. I think public media should encourage people to do something rather than just watching and listening. Yes, but it's a big challenge uh, facing us, especially in this day and age when people have more options in, term of their, in terms of their time. Yes. And perhaps TV is the last option for people in following the news. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I, 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 I always said uh, there's two parts of storytelling, story and telling. Story will always remain the same, mm. but telling may be manifest yeah. in different kind of devices. Yeah, that's, which where is the fine. that's where the challenge is. <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is well, actually at Thai PBS, we're really interested in transmedia communication mm. too. Like right now, we do it on air and mm. online, and I think it's, it's something that um, everybody has to adjust to this kind of new environment. Mm -hmm. And with the content, Thai PBS have to do a lot more as well because we cannot just be standalone unit any longer. No, and, and the key word for me is relevant. Mm -hmm. We have to continue to be relevant, not mm -hmm. only to the city folks, but everybody, you know, and try to be relevant to everybody in the old days is really difficult because you have only one television yeah. screen. Mm -hmm. But today <laughs> we have devices, we have many um, platforms. Mm. So I, I'm really positive about all this, even though people yeah. might raise questions. And I think another aspect that I realized that people have more literacy. They start mm -hmm. to understand what good media okay. is all about. Yeah. Yeah. And by that happening because we went through a lot of political turmoil mm -hmm. in the past and they learned that after all something that reliable and dependable and trustworthy is of yeah. great value. Mm -hmm. The one issue that uh, will be raised at the forum mm -hmm. is the challenge of financing. Yes. The Thai PBS now lives on money from the so-called syntax, right? Syntax, right. the tax on alcohol and tobacco. Uh -huh. And long term, I mean, there are many people who are afraid that this bill will not be sustainable. And, uh, and to try to get more money for the public broadcasting will not be easy. No. Politicians or even members of the public would be sort of uh, quite, quite concerned how the money will be used. So uh, long term, so what, and do, what do you think will be other options? Well, according I'm not talking specifically about Thai PBS. I mean, I'm talking about other broadcasters as well. Well, I, I think supporting from the people mm. is the key word. Supporting comes from many forms. Mm. It can be a direct supporting. It can be a kind of subscription. Mm. It can be a kind of donation. And I think one thing, according to the Thai PBS law, mm. we can make some income from uh, intellectual properties. Okay. So yeah. now by trying to invest in what we call on-demand, uh, SBOD, uh, subscription-based video on-demand, that would be another venue. Mm. But, but the most important thing, I think people have to be aware 
that there's a cost mm -hmm. in getting mm -hmm. valuable stuff. It's true. Right? Yes. And in that cost, good, dependable information is of great value mm -hmm. in today's society. Mm -hmm. So I, I still hope that we still have our purpose, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. our purpose is relevant. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, we will continue to gain the support from the public, either directly or indirectly. Yes. You know, the media are always seen as a major pillar of democracy, right? Mm -hmm. And it holds those in power, interest group, I mean, accountable. Yes. And how do you see the role of Thai PBS in this context? Well, I think the one thing that we, we ought to always do, I always say that actually public journalism is only a subset of journalism. Mm -hmm. So we, we will fail if we think that it's something separate. So, so in order to serve the public, we have to be good at our journalistic values mm -hmm. and do our basic work well, too. So I think that that kind of sums up my sentiment as mm -hmm. far as mm -hmm. uh, public uh, media is concerned. But more than service on the journalistic um, aspect, we also have to do entertainment mm -hmm. and something that people can use. We, we, we now have morning program that focus on do it yourself, you know, okay. <laughs> DIY, yes, yeah. and and so so I think perhaps, um, well, being a pillar in a democratic society is uh, the utmost important function. Yeah. But mm -hmm. there are also other functions that we have to to do as well to be mm -hmm. able to survive in this kind of chaotic um, media landscape. Mm. Mm -hmm. Talking about the challenge facing media, it's not only public media, but mm -hmm. overall, it's about disrupted by technology, disrupted mm -hmm. world, and how to transform the whole organization to, to face or to cope with digital transformation is a very big challenge, isn't it? Yes, and I, I think first of all we have to, well, you know, in the old days, broadcasting industry, we like a big factory. Today we have to change to small shops, and <laughs> these shops are quite, um, have to have their independence, uh, their own free wills, mm -hmm. but together working as a network. So this kind of transformation, uh, it cannot take forever because whoever cannot adjust will extinct, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. a dinosaur. Die away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so uh, the most important thing I think is, pe right now we are all aware that it's, it's of great importance that we change, mm -hmm. but the way of changing, we shouldn't forsake our fundamental role. This is my really concern. Mm -hmm. I, I don't concern too much about changing. I think people ought to change because there's a external factors pushing us to change. Mm -hmm. But how can we maintain our values? Mm -hmm. How can we maintain to be something that the public can trust amidst the change? That's that's the real challenge as far as being a deputy general director at yeah. PBS. But yes. do you think you now have the trust of the public after 10 years in service? I, I totally believe so. Mm -hmm. You know, from the cave incident in mm -hmm. Chiang Rai kind of proven beyond mm -hmm. all doubts that when things become really bad and the crisis hits the town, yeah. people tune to okay. Channel 3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, public media in many countries which are remaining intact, like in Sweden, in Switzerland, they have to be through soul-searching period as well. And in this conference, we will see a very important documentary from Swiss yes. Broadcasting Corporation. Mm. They will share with us their experience in having public hearing, having people vote mm. whether they would like to have public broadcaster in their society, right. which would be very valuable source for us to learn from them. I'm looking forward for <laughs> the, uh, to, to listen to the panels, to watch there's many films mm -hmm. and documentaries that really are valued for, for us as practitioners as well as oh, people, you know, mm -hmm. just to, to see how other people are doing. Actually, the conference is part of what we call inputs, yes. and these inputs are formed by organizations that involve in public broadcasting. Right. It's a non-profit organization. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. so I think it's a great opportunity. I would like to invite everybody, mm -hmm. if you have some time to spend, it's on the 15th and the 16th yes. of this month. And it's open to public. It is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And if, if you cannot come, but I would like to invite all of you, if you are interested in the role of Thai PBS in Thailand, mm. you can mm. watch us live on Facebook, or you can come to the Thai yeah. PBS, it's free event for all. Yeah. Yes. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who haven't very watched Thai PBS mm. at all. <laughs> so what would be your, <laughs> your message to these people? Who haven't watched Thai PBS <laughs> at all? Well, yeah. it's 10 years already, so <laughs> come and give us 
a chance, <laughs> you know. And uh, a lot of people said that um, when they give, they, they, they tune to us, they learn something. And mm -hmm. that, I mm -hmm. think that's, that's something that we can hope for public media to function, that when you watch something, you get to learn something. It can be an uh, international incident, or it can be just a small little yeah. thing that mm -hmm. make your life more workable in the day-to-day -day business. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So the public broadcasting does have a future. <laughs> well, <Wow>. yes. <laughs> I, I, I truly believe so. Okay. Yes, we uh, have to be optimistic. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so please come and join us on 15 and 16 of November. We have Public Media International Conference at the Thai PBS, or otherwise you can watch us on Facebook Live and many online platforms that we are serving you. So that brings us to the end of our program, Thai PBS World, tonight, and we'll meet you again next Thursday. Thank you, Kun Bipop, too. Thank you.